what you say. Well, thank you guys for having me back. Uh, that's always nice that you're welcome back. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm here to share kind of uh, the culmination of what I presented to you guys uh, probably a year ago, I, I would think. I don't know. Um, just real quick, uh, a little background, and then I'll, I'll get on to, to what, what happened. Um, to, to review, the first time I, guys, I told you guys my vision, I had, I had a vision. I, had a, I have a good friend who I, uh, st who student taught with me who asked me what Jesus was telling me in my quiet time. And uh, I told him that, uh, well, I, go, I think he's telling me to go on a missions trip, <laughs> which if you guys know me, like traveling down here to Temecula is considered a missions trip for me. <laughs> I, do, I do not like to travel. I have no desire to travel. And then to go outside the United States, it was, uh, that wasn't even in the plans. But I told him, this is what I've seen. I've seen uh, a raggedy baseball field. Uh, I've seen a, a water spigot. And I've seen a tree stump in center field. Okay? That's what I got. And he goes, and he goes <laughs> okay. And a week later, I was meeting with a man from E3 Ministries, which is a, a ministry base in Texas, but they have... Uh, they have a, a corporate office here in San Diego. I am second. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of I am second. So uh, our jersey said Yo Soy uh, Segundo, which I am second. Um, it's a great website. Uh, it's a, it, they give video testimonies. So you have professional athletes. You have just normal people. You have all kinds of actors. And their uh, video testimonies of, of their testimony. In their, and it's awesome. And uh, anyways... So uh, with that being said, I uh, met with Rick Eisman, and um, Rick said, well, what about Cuba? And I'm like, what about, what about it? And, and he, he said, why not? They like baseball. And I'm like, why not? I, to I just told you what I saw, and if that's, in, if that's in Cuba, then let's go to Cuba. And so uh, about a year and a half process it took, which was in my own, in my own uh, selfish ways um, was a battle. Because in, there were times where um, I would have arguments with God saying, all right, I stuck my neck out. You told me to tell somebody this vision, right? And I stuck my neck out, and this isn't happening. And so the first time we met, we didn't have enough kids to go. The second time we met, we had enough kids, and we put in for our religious visas because you can, take, you can now go to Cuba on a religious visa. And um, they came back to us like a month before we're supposed to leave and said they denied our visas because we didn't get them in 90 working days. It was, we got them in 90 days, they weren't 90 working days. So when a communist country tells you no, there's no argument, just so you guys know, like it's over. <laughs> you can't take it to a higher authority and say, hey, well, can somebody fix this? No, it's like, so the pastor we were working with said it's not a good idea to, um, to go. So we, uh, we then start, said we'll go in June. Um, the pastor that we were working with uh, at that point got a visa to come to the United States of America on a training, and then he never went back. That's a common theme right now in Cuba, believe it or not. It, I'm a kind of a conspiracy guy, so I, uh, religion or Christianity is blowing up there. I'm just going to tell you guys, it, it, it is on fire. And my opinion is that one of the ways that they're going to control it is um, is that they just, if a pastor, you can't get a visa out of there, just so you know. Like, it's really impossible if you're a, a, a national there, right? But for whatever reason, pastors get visas all the time, and then, but when they come to America, they never go back. Because if you were to go to Cuba, you would understand that reasons why they don't want to go back. America is a pretty awesome country, believe it or not. And um, so... We picked up another pastor, and uh, in June, um, we took 14 kids and six adults uh, gone on a plane. Um, we traveled down to Tijuana. Again, I'm not one to travel outside the country, so why not? we got to go to Tijuana, fly from Tijuana to Mexico City, Mexico City uh, to Cuba. And so I went outside the country in two different ways, right? Uh, but uh, it, it, it worked out. So... Um, two kids uh, picked up, we picked up late, so to kind of, um, some of the guys in this room helped support a young man who I wanted to go, who didn't end up going. But I'm going to tell you right now, 
there was a young man that, uh, that w- had, had been in the process the whole time, and he was ready to go. And his father, about a month before we were supposed to go, his father decided to um, basically leave the family, his whole family, um, close out every single uh, one of their bank accounts, take all the money, and just left the family, him, his sister, and his mom. This young man was like devastated, obviously dealing with that, um, but uh, we were able to scholarship him and he came on the trip. Um, the way God works is it's, it's insane when you're just when you're in it, you don't sometimes you don't see what's going on, but then when you get out of it, you can kind of you, you definitely see how God worked this whole thing out. So, um, meanwhile, a couple things um, prior to that. I'm the, I'm the chaplain for the Lake Elsinore storm. I was uh, first, first uh, week of when the storm came back in, uh, Terrence, the clubhouse manager, said, hey, I just cleaned out the clubhouse. I have like two huge bags full of shoes. Would you guys want to take those to Cuba? We said absolutely yes. Meanwhile, I, I ran into a guy who had a, a, a shirt that said DTB on, on his shirt. DTB is called Dovetail Bats. Dovetail Bats is a small mom and pop uh, wood bat company in Maine. Uh, they provide bats. Uh, they, they make bats uh, for the major leaguers. Really, really nice wood, really, really nice bats. I start talking to this man, and he finds out I'm the chaplain. Dovetail Bats is a Christian company. The dove represents the Holy Spirit. And this, this uh, mom and pop who started this business, um, wanted to make sure. Well, DTB, on, on, they didn't know it at the time, but they said Dovetail Bats. They just used the, the, uh, the acronym or the, the initials. They go down to the Dominican Republic to, to show their bats and have people start using them. And they get down to the Dominican Republic, and the Spanish there go, well, this means God bless you. And they're like, what are you talking about? Well, Dios te bendiga right? Means God bless you. And they're like, really? They didn't even know that's what their bats were communicating. But when they got down to the Dominican, they realized that that's what the bats were communicating. So this, he goes, you have to call our owner and tell him what you're doing. So I called the owner of Dovetail Bats, told him what we were doing, um, and he made personalized bats for every single one of our players, every single one of the, the chaperones that went and then he also, they also provided bats that were generic bats. So when we went down there, we left, we, left, we left everything there. That was our plan. When we went down there, we would leave everything there. Gloves, bats, helmets, uh, everything. We, just, we came back pretty much with nothing. All right, so what happened when we were there? We got to, we got to Cuba, um, and it was a long trip. It was about 22 hours of travel before we actually got to the church that we were uh, staying at. Um, it was in Placeta, Cuba. Placeta is pretty much dead center in the middle of the island. It's about 45 minutes outside of uh, Santa Clara. So Santa Clara is like the next biggest city to Havana. We flew into Havana. I stepped on the ground in Havana and was like, holy, I know this is church, but holy, we're in, a, we're in Cuba. Like, it, it was, it's surreal when it happens. I mean, this was a vision, and then prayer, and then we're there, right? They're very, um, you try to make, like, you try to smile, and you're like, hi, how are you? And they're like, just look at the camera, <laughs> and you take your picture, you show them your passport. But meanwhile, by the way, it's like, it, it's a trip how it all works out, because you go to, like, this little kiosk that's about this big in Mexico City, and you're like, hey, I need a visa to go to Cuba. And they're like, okay, that would be seventeen dollars, and, and you give them seventeen dollars, and they give you a tourist visa. So everybody has to go there on a tourist visa, and then when you get there, hopefully the people you're working with have your religious visas. The reason we wanted to get religious visas, which were more expensive, is because we were playing baseball and we wanted to share the gospel in public, which they allow you to do now. Um, so, anyways, we get to Cuba, we check in, five-hour bus ride from Havana uh, to Placeta. And this bus, just so you know, this bus came out of San Pedro. It's like this old yellow school bus that was all spray painted and it said, free the Cuban five, 
from the jaws of the United States of America on one side and some other stuff on the other side. If you guys want to see pictures, you can Facebook friend me. And all my pictures are on Facebook. Each day, I have pictures of each day um, that we were there. But this bus was like this insane bus that we drove around Cuba for a week. And it said, free the Cuban fry from, and I, there were five Cubans that got arrested here in the United States of America for, uh, for being spies, and this bus said wanted to free them. Um, so we got on this bus, no AC, no nothing, and it's dark. There's nobody on the road. Um, you are like the only one on the road, and we're going somewhere, and we have no idea. And we finally get there, and we get to this, uh, we get to um, the church, and so we get off the bus. My son's like, Dad, i got to go to the bathroom. And so I asked them where the bathroom was, and they, they pointed me to this, uh, to this bathroom, walked in, and I almost started crying because I'm like, there, I'm not going to make it. This, I mean, this is, it was, a, it was, it was, it was, first of all, it was too high, so I'm short. I'm like, how do I even squat on that? without? Because I, I didn't want to, because it's a, literally a hole in the ground, and there's bugs everywhere. But to make a long story short, uh, the room that we ended up hit, getting, uh, it had, it had a, like a little AC unit, which was like the, the coldest AC unit I've ever been underneath in my entire life. But... Uh, so anyways, um, it worked out. They have indoor plumbing there. You just can't put the, the paper in the toilet. All right, so uh, this is what our day looked like. We would wake up, and we would get to breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we would go from 8 to 8.30 breakfast, and then we'd have a short devotional. After the devotional, uh, we'd pile onto the bus, and then we would go, and we'd, we would uh, evangelize for two and a half hours. And we had pre meetings pre-set up um, with we worked with six different churches that were within Placetta and six different uh, pastors. And we, and we had meetings that they had already set up meetings and we would go and we evangelize. Now, it kind of it deferred from E3's model. E3's model was a, is a little different model. So you go there expecting one thing and then you just kind of got to let God do his thing because it's better that way. You just get out of his way. So... We thought we were going to be doing a lot of evangelizing. What we ended up doing a lot of is encouraging, to be honest with you. Um, and, I, and I think that's the theme of today. This, this group of men that show up every Thursday, it, it, it doesn't matter that it's in a, in a restaurant. When you go to Cuba, it doesn't matter if you're in a garage, if you're in a school, if you're in a building or a house, right? That's church. Right? We ran in, we encouraged the family not knowing. We, we, went, we visited a family, a husband, a wife, two kids, and they're like, hey, we want to show you our church, which was a garage attached to their house. Now, their house was probably uh, put this divider up, and that's the size of their house. And then the, the, church, the garage, uh, they just said, we, feel, we felt as though God was telling us to dedicate this garage to him. So you walk into this little, Cuba's the only place where I had to duck in my whole entire life going into places. So I felt really tall, okay? But literally you duck, and this, it was just a small garage. Now, check this out. This is, this is where things blow me away. The man across the street is a baker, owns a bakery. Came to this family and said, we will pay you $120 U.S. money to use that space. And this family, by the way, who's giving a ration card from that government that's supposed to last a month, which lasts probably about two weeks at the most, okay, who makes $20 a month, told him, no, sorry, we've dedicated this to the Lord. Okay? $120 U.S. is insane, right? And these people said, no, thank you, we have dedicated this to the Lord. And when we went in there and we spoke with the, this lady and her husband, she was just weeping and saying, thank you so much for coming because you completely, totally affirmed what we're doing for God. And all we did was show up and say, hey, God loves you and we love you and this is, we're just so, like, they, in Cuba, they don't have peepholes in their doors. 
like we do, right? The door, somebody knocks on our door in America, and you're like, don't answer it. We're not home. But all four, all, all four cars are there, and the dogs are barking, and they're like, we know you're in there. And you're like, leave us alone. You know, and, and Cuba, like, they just like, come on in. And then they give you their seat. And they say, why are you here? And then you get to explain to them why you're there. And then sometimes we ran into already believers and then others, you know, 27 people came to the Lord while we were there. Amen. So, now, you have to understand we have a bunch of teenage boys, right? That was another little deal that I was having trouble with because the enemy would... Every now and then I'd be driving to school and be like, what the heck are you doing taking teenage boys to Cuba, right? And I'd freak out. I'm like, I don't know. Why am I doing this? And uh, again, get out of myself. It wasn't me doing it. It was God sending us. We had two, the, the boy I was telling you about that got scholarship. He roomed with myself, my son, and another boy. And he, the first night we were there, he's like, coach, I have no idea why I'm here. I can't play. His back was hurt. He goes, I can't play. I've never had anything given to me in my life. I didn't pay for this. Everybody else on this trip paid for their way. I'm the only one that got a scholarship. Why the heck am I here? And we had this awesome discussion about gifts, right? right? And, um, and uh, the next day, he went into a home, and there was a lady that was explaining to the team he was on about uh, her life and her family and the struggles that her family was going through. And Lisa Stewart, who was, our lead, who was our leader, turned to this young man, and before she could get the words out, because she's like, you need, to, you need to tell your story. He's like, she's like, Grant, you? And he's like, I know, I need to tell my story. So he told this lady his story about his family and what was going on. Her response was, oh my gosh, I didn't know that type of stuff happened in the United States of America. And then he told her, went on to tell her why he was there on this trip and, and how him being able to share with her, is, he's now understanding how great God is. And, this, and it was just like this amazing moment. He came home and he sat down on his bed. He looked at me and he's like, Coach, I know why I'm here. Which a confused young man who was betrayed by his earthly father, understands that a heavenly father that loves him dearly will never betray him. Amen. And this is a 17-year-old boy. We had, two other, we had another situation where these boys walked into this house and this elderly woman, all she wanted to do was sing for them. Right? So I know Rudy's like all fired up, but they're, they're gonna, they were totally honest and transparent. They're like, oh my God, this is going to go bad. You know, we don't want to hear her sing. Like, and she's like going through all these tracks and she throws in this track and she starts singing. And Lisa's like, she could have sang like at, at the Grand Ole Opry. She an amazing voice. So they're just listening to this lady sing, right? Her son was with them, goes into the back room and he leaves. She's singing and she's singing and she finishes her song and somebody knocks on the door. So there was a lady that was walking by who heard the song on the street, stopped and stood outside the door and listened to this song, knocks on the door, they, allow, they say, come on in, and she goes, I want to know the Jesus that you were just singing about. And they led her to Christ. This boy, nine-year-old little, little boy across the street, comes across the street, knocks on the door, and says, hey, I'm having trouble with nightmares. That song, that, that guy in the song, is, I think is the answer. And so the, these teenage boys are praying over this little nine-year-old boy about his nightmares, and he accepts Christ. The, the, the lady's son, who's lived with her his whole entire life, comes out of the back room weeping and decides this is the time to give his heart to the Lord and gives his heart to the Lord. And our kids are like, what is going on here? <laughs> right? And this stuff is just happening. Right? And they're, they're just, it, it's just this amazing time where we didn't, weren't focusing on ourselves. We were just, why are, you know, we're here 
and just let's show, let's tell a story and just show love, right? And I'm going to tell you right now. So we would play a game. So we would go evangelize for two and a half hours. We'd come back, we'd have uh, lunch, and then we would get ready and we'd go play a game. The first game we played, we had we have a little a kid on our team. He's, he's a shorter young man. The grass, the grass in the outfield, you could barely see him. It was like up to here on it, right? <laughs> Everything stopped. When they say time stopped in Cuba, it literally stopped. All you car fanatics say hey, it's great that you can go see 57 Chevys, but I'm just going to blow it for you guys. They've ripped out all the gas engines, and they're all diesel. Because diesel on the black market, and we'll get to the black market in a second, is way cheaper than regular gas. So we would play these games. And Trevor would come up to me and goes, Dad, we're in Cuba about to play a baseball game. And then... Everything is owned by the government, oh, by the way, right? So after the game, we would, we would meet with the other team, and we said, oh, yeah, we're here to play baseball, but this is the real reason why we're here. And then we would be able to uh, uh, discuss the gospel, to evangelize them on a, on a, uh, a government-owned property. It was insane. It, like, it was insane. And so... The week was super busy, and then we'd come home, we'd have uh, dinner, and then we'd have like an hour downtime, and then we worked with six different churches, the Pentecostal Church, the Baptist Church, the Independent Church, the uh, uh, Assemblies of God Church. Oh my God, it didn't matter what the church was. They all worked together, which is like this really like phenomenon that America, in some cases, doesn't understand. But the church is the church. They serve one God. And that is, you know, our Heavenly Father, who is uh, by the name of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us and rose again three days later so that we could have a relationship with Him. And that's who they serve. We went to, the first service we went to on Sunday was an Assemblies of God church, uh, service. It was 92 degrees, yeah, 95% humidity, under a tin roof, and it was four hours long. Three and a half hours, four hours long. The, the ladies in the church were pulling our kids out of their seats and dancing with them in the aisles. And our kids were like, what? It? Like, what it? it was awesome. Our kids were so far out of their comfort zone. It was, um, it was awesome. The Baptist church say, hey, come on up here. They gave them tambourines. They gave them maracas. They gave them this. And our kids were up there like, what is going on? And they're twirling. It was awesome. So that's what we do at the end of the it, it was the kids ground. I'm going to just, it was a grind for about 12, you guys know, 12 hours, 14 hours, you know. And they, they just, the, the relationships that they built and the transparency, so proud of them that they, it happened so fast. We had a youth night at the church we were staying at that if we could, we filmed, but if we could just send that out throughout the whole world and say, it didn't matter if you were Cuban or American. There was, one re there was one thing going on there, and that was the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ was all over that place. The Holy Spirit was just flowing. And, and I just don't understand. I can't, I, I could show that to anybody. I would have a hard time. How is that wrong? How is that right there wrong? Whatever your belief is, I just don't understand how that is wrong. It was an amazing experience. And so getting back to the black market, it was interesting to sit back on a daily basis and just see their world work, right? Because the black market is where they survived. The, the, the interpreters that we had, their, one of their biggest dilemmas was, OK, I get X amount of money. If I buy eggs from a government store, it's going to cost me $5 a dozen. But if I buy eggs, from the black market, it's going to cost me $1.50, it doesn't. But I know that the eggs on the black market are stolen, so am I committing sin by buying these eggs? And they're asking me, I'm like, you're asking me? Like, I'm coming from the United States of America. I could drive to a store and buy eggs, and oh, by the way, my neighbor has a couple of chickens I can buy eggs from. Like, I don't have to deal with this. Like, so you're asking me this question that's an insanely deep question, and I'm going to tell you that I'm glad I'm not the judge at the end, but I'm going to say this. Our God is a wonderful, wonderful God, and he, you, the, here's, this is what you've been dealt. 
and you're dealing with it. And I'm going to say that I don't think he's going to kick you out for buying eggs from, you know, the black market. We burnt fuel, right? That bus that we drove around in probably burnt more fuel that week than they burnt all year long. So every day at about 4 o'clock, the government bus would pull into the yard. And they would siphon the gas out of the government bus and put it in the barrels. The pastor would be doing it. <laughs> it's like, all right, well, the government buses, the drivers, they, nobody makes any money there. So they have, a certain a lot, they have a certain amount of fuel that they can burn on a daily basis. So what they do is they just sit, and then they go sell the fuel on the black market because they make more money. Yeah. And so in order to afford fuel, you have to buy it on the black market. Right? So every day at 4 o'clock, the government bus would pull in, and they'd do their thing, and we'd be like... So we called our pastors... Um, we call them the godmother and the godfather because literally they're, they are dialed in as far as knowing people. And um, wonderful, wonderful people. And we are really fortunate that, again, when you start the process, you think it's going to go one way, but then it goes another. So the pastor we were technically working with, I'm not going to... I can see how God worked because all 20 of us were able to stay at that one church. They have a, a, a youth hostel. So we all got to stay in that one church on the same grounds with, with each other. And it was, it was insane. What I would like to just say about the whole trip and what we took from it. Um, that, there is so much love and grace in that country from people that should be really pissed off because they get screwed every single day. They, the, the government, they can't even call them by name. If you call them by name, you go to jail. So they call him the bearded one and his brother. They take a census of the cows. They count the cows. And it has nothing to do with religious views, but they count every single cow because you can't kill a cow in, in Cuba because it's a 13-year prison sentence if you do. So you eat pork and you eat chicken. And this cow, your starving family, will walk across and you can't do anything about the cow. And if the cow dies or has a baby and dies, you have to put out a full-on report as to why the cow died and then they have to determine whether it was negligence or something like that. Yeah. Propaganda. Hey, it, it, you know, it, the government, just so you know, uh, they, they redid streets in Havana and took the Pope around those streets so they could see those streets. Took Obama around those streets so they could see those streets. When Obama came into town, they put all the evangelicals in jail because they, didn't, they don't have the resources to follow them, right? So the, and the evangelicals were in jail until Obama left, and then they let them out. That's just so they could keep track of where they're going or, where, or what they're doing. The nationals... Everybody says Cuba's opening up. It's going to open up, but it's going to open up in certain places. So you have car companies like Peugeot that are like, oh, we're, we're allowing Peugeot. And well, the, uh, to buy a Peugeot there, it's like $50,000 for a car. Who has $50,000 when you're making $25 a month, right? Um, so the, the propaganda and the things that are going on there, we were, we were in the sticks, so to speak. I have a, an educator friend, a colleague, who went on an educational deal, and they, they saw what the government wanted them to see. We saw, like, the stuff, in my opinion. Boots on the ground. This is how real life is in Cuba. And so you have this, these people that just, the, the love and the grace that we were shown was insanely amounts. And as, as what I heard from you guys in Uganda. And so, um, you know, I just want to show, I want to be, I want to have that much love and grace. You know, if, if my life is only love and grace, and, and it's coming from God, who, oh, by the way, gifted us grace, right? It's a gift. It's nothing we can earn. And we just, we just simplify things instead of getting into the, theological debates and all these technical issues. And yeah, it's important to study the Bible 
I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. But you can simplify this whole thing really, 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 really simple. And that is, we have a God that loved us so much that he sent his only son to this earth to die for us so that we could have a relationship with him and live with him for eternity. And when he got on the cross and he bore all our sins, it was finished. It's finished. And the enemy wants to tell you that it's not. So anything that you're carrying, anxieties, whatever it might be that you're still holding on to, just so you know, it's finished. And if you don't truly believe in that it's finished, then why the heck did Jesus do what He did on the cross? Because we're not living a life of, that, that God wants us to live. Isaiah 55.2.3 says, Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Yeah, I figure that because of breakfast, you know. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Here and your, your soul shall live. If we could live in that power every single day, and just show love and grace, just think the change that could happen. And it doesn't matter if it's in a restaurant. It doesn't matter if it's in a garage. It doesn't matter if you're at the gas tank or wherever you are at. Love and grace, really, really simple things. Say hi. That's another amazing thing. It blew our kids away. From this tall to the 100-year-olds, that we, they greet everybody there. If, you, if, if, if we're in Cuba right now and everybody, somebody walked through the store, every single person would be greeted. It's like simple, you know, simple things in everyday life. They do so much with so little, and it was an amazing thing to see. So what's next? And if you guys have any questions, what's next? Um, to be honest with you, we're already, starting, we're already starting to plan another trip back in June to take another baseball team. We're all, I've also met with uh, three other men. Um, a, a man that attends a Bible study that I go that I that I do on Wednesday mornings was at a gym working with, uh, working out and told this man named Tony, who ended up being Tony Boyd, said, "Hey, I, I go to Bible study with Monty Jones." He's like, "Oh, I know Monty Jones," and he goes, "Yeah, he just came back from Cuba." And Tony's like, "Really?" He goes, "Well, ask Monty what it might take in order to build a, a church there." Because Tony and Mike Brisson have been around the world and built many churches. So we've now met to discuss what that might look like. When we were there, the pastors that we stayed with want to build a new temple. They, they, have, a, they, you can, they have favor. That it, it's hard to explain, but you can just tell that there's favor with them. They have a washing machine ministry. They have five washing machines. A washing machine in Cuba is like us owning a Ferrari. And they wash the clo as many clothes as they can for their community. They feed the community. And so I don't know where that's going. I don't know what that looks like. I'm, it's just one of those things where you just kind of take the steps, and as God opens up doors, you walk through them. Which leads, leads me to the last thing. My son on that trip was profoundly affected. And there were seven kids on that team that, that uh, go to a, a, a school called Rancho Christian. And when he got home, he, said, he came to mom and dad and said, hey, what do you think about me going to Rancho Christian? And we're like, well, I never thought about paying for your high school education. But then we took a deep breath and we said, well, what we'll do is we'll promise we'll go through the process and as doors open up, we'll walk through them. And doors just flew open. Now, he, now my son has transferred to Rancho Christian and is going to be attending Rancho Christian this this next year. Life changer. Now, what, is that, what did that tell me? <clears throat> um, and again, it's not about me, but God speaks. And So, what it, what it told me is this. We create these little worlds that we want to live in. Us. We create our own little worlds. Right? And I created this world for my son. I did. Not God. I did. From the time that he was born to the time that he, that, where he is now, I created this world that he was going to live in. And this world, Dad was going to get control because I'm going to keep him safe and it's going to be the best thing for him, right? 
So I got to pick his teachers that he, got, that he went to. Because he went to school. At, I'm a school teacher at Myriad Valley. He went to school with me. Right? And so I get to pick his teachers. I get to pick his classes. I get to coach him. Right? So I'm in control of coaching him. And then in football, I, was in, I wasn't in control. But I had input with those coaches because they're my peers. You know? And so I had this little world that I was created for Trevor to live within. And God's like, dude, he's not yours. So let me show you the world that I have created for him. And that, and and in trying to walk and be obedient to the Spirit, that's what we did. And we're praying that that uh, Trevor finds the the godly relationships that he built when he was in Cuba. That they just they continue to blossom at Rancho Christian. Trevor is one of those kids where he'll do what he's told to do. He's not to the point yet in, in his maturity where he takes initiative all the time. right? So for two years, he showed up with Dad in the morning, and he saw Dad break open his Bible, and he saw Dad do his Bible study, and he saw Dad pray in his prayer journal. And I, and I didn't want to push it on him, and I just pray that, that one time he'd say, hey, what are you studying? And like, I was just, ah, that's going to be the open door. He never asked. I'd be like, hey, do you have any prayer requests? And every now and then he'd throw me one. But now Trevor's got to go to Bible class, and he'll do it because he's got to get a good grade. And he will. I mean, he'll get a good grade in it, but he'll study the Bible because he has to. It's awesome. So thank you guys for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, it was a life changer, and there's some awesome things going on in Cuba and we look forward to the next uh, chapter or the, the next door that, that, uh, that God wants us to walk through. Um, and we want to walk through that door um, with faith and, and excitement to see what God uh, is doing. So thank you guys for having me again. Appreciate it. Love you guys. Continue to do what you're doing because this is awesome. And again, don't get caught up. <laughs>